Hi everyone. Welcome to Inside I Am. And in today's conversation with me, I have myself. I have news and I'm really happy to share with you that I got into ISB. So today's video is going to be about three things. First, how I got in. Second, how you can. And third, taking up the most commonly asked questions about ISB, IAM, SCAT, and GMAT. Let's begin. And when we begin, we do the first things first, which is what is my profile? So 10th, 12th, and grad, I had decent marks above 80, uh, not in grad, but otherwise. Um, I had a 720 on GMAT, and I had extracurriculars filled with sports, debating, MUNs, uh, founding my organization. So very diverse experiences because I really enjoyed doing that. If, you're, if you want more specifics, I put in the link to my profile in the description for you to check later. But for now, uh, I know you see me as your host here, but honestly, I've been in the MBA game and the MBA pursuit for three years now. And um, when, the, when the first time I started, it was taking CAT in 2019. And that, that was the, uh, the amateur attempt where I thought I could do anything in this world. And so I just started preparing and I thought I'll get a 9900 percentile even. And I got a, I just crossed 90 that year. I had a call from IM Shillong, a shortlist from there. And um, I know I'm in general category, but I still had it. Uh, and I was so upset that I didn't even fill the form that they asked you to fill. I did take interviews uh, for the other IMs I got in. I got into a couple of baby IMs, but I rejected it. And then uh, in 2020, I decided to apply to ISB. And that year I didn't prepare for CAD because all my time went into GMAT. And so when I got rejected uh, in the interview, I basically had no backup because I was confident I'd make it. And uh, so that was, that was the time when I was really disappointed and I was just um, sort of doubting myself and questioning whether I'm even capable of doing all of this. I still thought that I hadn't given a cat my best attempt because I knew that was an amateurish attempt the first time. And this was the time when everybody else was sort of going to other colleges because you've spent two years in the CAD journey and people start asking questions. And, you know, I, I started doubting myself too. I just didn't know whether I had it in me. So I had the chance to go into the newer uh, B schools in the country. They seemed very promising. I had a great scholarship, the 24 lakh MBA, I could do it in four lakhs. I was very inclined to do this, but um, I just thought about it one day and I, uh, realized that I might grow up 10 years down the line and tell myself that, you know, had I studied, I would have got into IMA or ISB. And I just didn't want to live with that regret again. I already had it after class 12th. I wanted to go abroad. I didn't, I didn't make it the first day. I didn't try again, got into DU. I felt like a settlement. So I didn't want that. And so I told myself the third year, I'll prepare for CAT as best as I can. I already had GMAT, so I wanted to apply to ISB again. And this was the time when I went in with full-fledged effort. Along with my job here at Inside IIN, I would study about five hours at least every day. I didn't count, but this is what I estimated to be. And then everything was going well. I thought I would get to a 99 percentile finally in my third attempt in 2021. But in September, something happened. Uh, it was a personal thing, and it took a mental toll on me. That was really bad. Uh, September is a very important time for a serious aspirant. It's the time when you almost, you're into taking mocks or you either start. Mm -hmm. And that one entire week when that thing happened, I couldn't do anything at all. So I lost a complete week. And even after that, when I bounced back, it wasn't quite bouncing back because I was just mentally, I couldn't focus. I had thoughts in my head, my study time reduced, my efficiency reduced. And that entire period just made me feel really bad about myself because I was in my third attempt. Uh, I had a lot of achievements earlier, you know, in school, I played national basketball, national debating, international MUNs. But honestly, these achievements were too old to give me confidence in my ability. I didn't resonate with that ocean. I just felt like a failure at, at this point. It was my third attempt and things weren't going well at all in September. And I interviewed one cat topper. He told me the lowest mock score he had was 98 percentile. And I sat there wondering when I'm going to reach 98 percentile. So that, that uh, was the lowest point in my life. And the only way, the way I, I got back up was just building this atmosphere around me that motivated me, motivated me to work hard despite everything. I would get very upset during days and I would take time out for getting upset. Yeah, that kind of planning. 
and then i'd watch videos i played basketball so i followed kobe bryant i followed michael jordan i went back to their you know philosophy and everything cut to the um, ultimate day uh, a cat didn't go well at all i still scored around the 90 percentile mark i was very embarrassed because you guys were asking me what my percentile was and i didn't have the courage in me to tell you that this is what my percentile is but that's what it was and uh, the other thing that was happening from september to november was my preparation for isb i made my application my essays it's very rigorous and i'll come to that in a bit but i was confident that i'll get the interview shortlist so i started preparing for the interviews even before i got the shortlist and then uh, as luck would have it my isb interview was scheduled on the same day as we had cat so then i wrote them an email uh, requesting it to prepone postpone so finally one day before cat i had my isb interview and then i had cat next day cat didn't go well isb interview did and that's how uh, i'm standing here speaking with you today so um yeah that was uh, i made a script for it but i didn't follow it i uh, got lost in my thoughts but uh, okay i'll check it now the key takeaways i've made for you guys from my journey so far they've the first the third attempt the third time of preparation was my most mature attempt and the first thing i kept in mind was i wanted to be very very clear about what i was doing and why personally so why should i study 14 hours a day and by the way i did this on my most productive days i studied for 14 hours a day even i don't believe it but i did and i asked myself why should i work hard uh, what do i get in return what do i not get in return why should i want to do an mba in the first place and you see people usually have two different answers why mba ka there's one personal answer and then there's one answer you tell the adcom in my case in the third attempt i wanted both the answers to be same and that's what i did i made them then um, why hard work why sacrifice what if i fail in my third attempt and what's the price i'm willing to pay uh, to get into isb or iim because honestly these were on the only two schools that i really wanted to get into the other schools were great and they are great and there's no disrespect to them but personally this was the ambition and the dream you know we all have dreams and th- this was mine the second thing was honesty and everybody will tell you okay be honest be yourself but the thing is when you start doing it it becomes really difficult and you feel vulnerable because what if i tell you that in my free time i watch netflix and then you insult me for it or you cross question me and embarrass me so it 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 feels very vulnerable putting yourself out there but this third time and in my second attempt i did that you know even at isb i just told them whatever i wanted to to just be the candidate i thought would get in and that didn't work so this time i wanted to be honest and i made a genuine attempt to do so i told myself that i just want to see whether jaisi bhi main hu just howsoever i am kya main layak hu am i enough and that's really what i told myself let me just go out there and see if i am enough for isb and you know the answer so yeah honesty <laughs> okay the third is um the big takeaway from this journey is being patient and owning up your failures and i know it sounds cliche but it's very hard to do because we're in india and we have relatives and they are curious people so you want to tell them that you failed three times you better have a lot of courage to do that i didn't i ran away i didn't tell anyone what i was doing but um finally when i realized that failures have taught me so much in life i just stopped doing that they asked me this question you know what is the biggest challenge in your life that you faced so far and i was told and the expert advice was that you tell them about some challenge like basketball or something some extra curriculars where me you tell them but i just took a moment there 30 seconds or so and i thought about it and i told them that the biggest challenge was i didn't get into isb last year i didn't take cat i was so low so upset didn't know what to do didn't know if i was capable and you know what they told me they told me they appreciated the honesty and they really appreciated i could see it in their feedback so um just owning up your failure people understand it and i think you should do it too because for me it clearly worked okay yeah uh, and of course patience uh, if i would have hurried again in my first attempt i would uh, probably not have been of course not have been at isb so yeah uh, patience helps uh, there are people and you'll find their video on inside i am as well they had six attempts so that kind of patience if you really want something and they, then they got it so that was my journey um we'll go to the next part of today's conversation which is how can you get in and 
I think the best way to do that is to take up the 10 questions about ISB that we most commonly receive. I think your question of how to get in will be answered through it. First common question is why ISB? So there's no general answer I can give you because I'm just one person who got into ISB, but I can give you my answer. There were three main reasons why I considered ISB. The most honest one is I wanted to diversify my portfolio. I know I speak like an economics student, but I have been one. That's how I approach things in life and everything. So I just didn't want to be dependent on uh, exams like CAT, ZAT, and the likes of it. I wanted to apply to all the top schools in the country. And I was willing to take GMAT, do whatever it takes to do that, because probabilistically speaking, that increases my likelihood of getting into a top B school. And ISB, so coming to ISB, which is now reason number two, particularly, the peer group at ISB for me is very inspiring. There are nobody at ISB, nobody, there's no one with zero uh, work experience. The kind of profiles they have, it's very diverse there. So that's why I think you should consider ISB too, if you really want to make the most out of your MB. Consider it. Uh, second, was the profs. I really like the professors there. Some of them have been, personally, I've been mentored by them and I've had the chance to interact with them closely. And that's how I, uh, the, the respect for me increased for them. But otherwise also, there's, uh, you know, CEO of Nestle Nutrition who now teaches at ISB. There are a lot of folks there who personally inspired me. And you can argue the same happens at IIMs or any other top B school and you'd be right in saying so. But personally, it was a reason for me. I wanted that kind of exposure for myself in India. Because I was clear I didn't want to settle abroad at all or do my MBA there. Didn't make sense for me financially or otherwise. The third reason why ISB, because credibility. Because ISB is doing really well and people look up to it. The kind of opportunities you get after ISB. All in all, you know, I wanted to also build my credibility through my MBA. And I thought ISB would really assist me do that in, in doing that. Now we'll go to the next one, which is why ISB and why not IIMs and other top B schools in the country? Now, this is very controversial and very opinionated, and my answer will be very biased, but I'll still, now that I've cautioned you, I'll tell you my answer. My answer primarily lies in the kind of peer group that's there at ISB. This is the only thing that I think makes it a win for me to go to ISB. Not like I had the choice to go to IMA, so I mean, what am I even saying? But just telling you that the diversity factor is very important, and they are the people who form your network years later. And I really want to be a part of a strong network that'll help me succeed in my career, not just during the MBA, but you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line. So that's, that's the primary reason why not others and why ISB. And then of course, there's the ranking, et cetera. You can check it all out. So even, even that's a factor you can consider. Third common question, what's the average package at ISB and what is the fees and what's the ROI it doesn't add up. So uh, for the past two years, I mean, so this year, the average salary is 34.07 lakhs per annum. And last year was 28.21 lakhs per annum. But here's the caution. Please don't divide it by 12 because it's just not how it works. In these salary figures, A, their averages. Average in itself is statistically not the best way to look at things, but it's a common question, so I'm taking it up. Second is there's a lot of variable components. There are bonuses, optional payments, et cetera, that are all part of this. Then of course you have your taxes and all of these things deflate the enhanced salary that you get by a lot. So, um, but it's just that it happens for all B schools. So in that regard, you can look at ISB as a winner in this case, but again, take it with a pinch of salt. Peace. Again, everybody is like really upset and worried about oh, where do I get those 40 lakhs from? And is this a rich kid's school? Because if you can't afford the 40 lakhs, how do you do the MBA? So I spoke to a lot of alums about it and I learned that, nine, and that's what they say, 95% uh, of all folks in their class, they took a loan to go to ISB. So it's, it's, it's like people like you and me who get in there and then they manage uh, to make financial sense of it. The other point is about ROI. And I personally don't, uh, I strongly despise the ROI argument, which says, just look at the fees, look at the average salary, ah, boom, ROI. I don't think it works that way. Because you see, going to a top B school adds a badge to you. It adds credibility to you. And that credibility gives you so many opportunities throughout your career, right? From placement to promotion, to job switching, to collaborating with alums to maybe, you know, create your own startup. I mean, you, you, you can't realistically just put a value to it. And I mean, that, that's what I think. So, for the, so that's why I, I don't buy the ROI argument. There's another argument, which is the opportunity cost, because ISB is a one-year uh, program, which means that the next year you can start earning. 
So the opportunity cost wise, it makes sense. If you think 40 lakhs is a big deal, then ISB may not be the school for you because you can make it to other top schools and pay 20, 25 lakhs. Definitely should go ahead and do it. I was willing to do this because it was really my dream school and I was willing to pay all of that price to be an ISBM. And you may not choose to do so, it's perfectly fine. Okay, next question, which is the admission process at ISB. How do I get into ISB? What do I need to do? So let me break it down in three parts. And there are three parts to it. The first is your application form. All your details, uh, who are you? What have you done in the past? Write an essay, tell us about your hobbies. You have all of that in the application form. You write it, send it, and then they tell you whether you, you've cleared it or not. Second is GMAT and GRE. You need a GMAT or a GRE score to get into ISB. There's no role that CAD plays here. And the third thing is the interview. We go to the next question, which is how can you get into ISB? And I'll break it down in two parts. It's a common question. It's a broad question. I'll take, break it down in two parts. One is pathwise, which is what are the ways that ISB has made for you to get into ISB? So the first way is called YLP or Young Leaders Program. This is for people who are in their pre-final or final year in college, in college right now, as of now. That's why it's called Young Leaders Program. The second path is EEOs, which is early entry option. This is for people who have less than 24 months of work experience, full-time work experience. And um, the third one is the PGP program, which is for folks who have more than 24 years of work experience. So if you closely look at it, you could be anyone from a pre-final year college student to someone with 10 years of work ex. All of you can get into ISB through either one or the other of these programs. And what do you need? So if you're a YLP, you just need to submit your application without GMAT or GRE. That's how the first round works. At least it did for me uh, when I applied in 2020. And then when you get selected in the second round, then they ask for another essay and your GMAT GRE. So to apply, and if you're a college student, you just need to prepare your application. But for EEOs and PGPs, while you're applying with the application, you'll need a GMAT or a GRE score. That's how it works. So this was pathwise how you can get into ISB. Let's go profile-wise. What profile get, gets into ISB? And this could be a separate video in itself, but I'll, I'll be very crisp and I'll tell you. And this comes from what, what are my sources? First is the admissions blog written by the ISB at com. Second is the webinar I did and we did at Inside I Am with ISB, someone from there at com. And third is from alums and people who've got into ISB. So three things. First, they look at your academic record. They look at the academic foundation you've had, which means they look at your 10, 12 grad scores, plus they look at your GMAT and GRE. So what do you do if you have low uh, CATs? You compensate with GMAT and other things in your profile. What are the other things? So that brings me to the second point, which ISB says is leadership attributes. So they're looking for people who show leadership attributes and have the potential to just go and ace it out there. And the way they test it is they look at your initiatives, things you've done, positions of responsibility achievements that you've had, or if you're a working professional, the kind of career growth that you've had. That establishes concrete proof, um, the closest to concrete at least, of your leadership attributes. And then there's the third bit, which is personal attributes. So as a person, what you are and what you do, a lot of it reflects through your interests and your extracurriculars. That's what ISB says. And of course, I agree because in my case, it did too. I was interested in sports, in debates, in MUNs. And that's what I did in my extracurriculars. So these are the three broad attributes slash things uh, broadly that ISB looks for. Now we'll go to the next question, which is which ISB campus is better? So ISB has two campuses. One is Mohali, one is Hyderabad. Everyone has heard of Hyderabad, but ISB has a very strong uh, philosophy slash ideology of one, camp, uh, one school, two campuses. Means when they have their placements, all of all the students in a cohort, they go to Hyderabad for it. So the allocation, that's done by the team, the ISB adcom, and you don't have control over it. So there's not a lot you can do apart from just having a preference. Next question, is ISB the place for freshers, for working professionals? Is it the place for them? So for freshers, there's no, there are no freshers at ISB, but so you can't go to ISB as a fresher, but you can surely apply. And then once you have the two years of work X, you can go. So they'll give you a deferred admission. Okay, you'll get into their class of XYZ year. And that year would be the year when you've completed a minimum of uh, two years of work experience. And then you can even defer your admission if you want to complete more years of work. Ex, but that depends on the ad common 
your case. For workex people, it's great because you'll find a lot of people who are at your level in terms of work experience. So the discussions will be mature. You'll get to learn a lot, and you won't be in a place full of pressures where you may not have the best experience. Next question: Can I get into ISB with lower CADs? Yes, you can. Um, people have, and you must compensate for it specifically by showing them that you're academically able. And how do you do that? You do that via the GMAT or the GRE. You aim to get as high a score as you possibly can to make up for it and to just make the case that you are up there. Then you have the other two points as well, which is personal attributes and leadership attributes. The better you stand in those, the better and more likely it is that you will get through. Next, what is a safe GMAT score for ISB? And uh, what's the ISB cutoff for CAT? That was also a question. So there's no CAT. You can't apply to ISB through CAT. Uh, what's the GMAT cutoff? There's no cutoff again. There's no sectional cutoff. There's no overall cutoff. What's a safe GMAT score? So the average um, uh, is for the classes around 710, 710, 713. That's the range. Um, and now it will make sense for you to think, hey, let me just cross the average or get as close to the average as I can. And it should be safe. But there's a little bit of a detail here, which is that people who have higher work experience, generally speaking, uh, they have slightly lower GMAT scores. Compared to people who have lower work experience, they usually tend to have very high GMAT scores. So you must see what category you fall in. You set your target according to your profile, your ACADs, your work X, all of it. Question number 10, final question. What uh, should I take, uh, CAT or GMAT? Or how do I take both? Or how do they compare? So I prepared for CAT for two years. One attempt I didn't prepare. And I've prepared for GMAT two times. I took it twice to get to 720. So five times I've taken both uh, the exams combined. And from that experience, here's what I think. GMAT English, everything you study under it, which involves critical reasoning, by the way, helped me ace uh, the VRC section of CAT. And you may not define it at, as ace, but it was for me because that year when I only prepared for GMAT, I took CAT just to have the experience of taking that exam. And I got a 97 something percentile in English. And I had not specifically prepared for CAT at all. And I had taken GMAT in October. Um, so it helped me. And most coaches will agree that GMAT RCs will really help you do well on CAT RCs. So that's number one, what helps. Number two, I think CAD quant helps a lot with GMAT quant, how it builds the knowledge base. Uh, you'll know the concepts, you'll understand the formulas, you'll have the knowledge, the bedrock you'll have. The only thing you'll have to change is the approach. And that comes brings me to the next point, which is what does not help. The approach you take when you solve a CAT versus a GMAT question is very different. And you know, I tried preparing for both in 2020 for a week or so, I was thoroughly confused because the approach for one doesn't really help in the other often. We'll come to the second bit, which is the VRC grammar. So it doesn't matter if you can't correct a sentence when you're taking CAT. It doesn't test you on that, but GMAT does. So your grammar becomes very important. And the simple thing with grammar is it has rules. So if you don't know the rules, you will make mistakes. So you'll have to prepare thoroughly for the grammar bit if you want to take the GMAT. And then there's the third point, which is GMAT additionally has the AWA section, which is your analytical writing ability. And even though the score you get in the AWA is not important, it does expect you to write um, when you're taking the exam. So personally, if you're not good at English, if you can't write a lot, you will have to work on that a little bit uh, when you take the GMAT. So that was uh, your 10 most commonly asked questions. We'll come to the concluding bit, which is, um, I've been here for an year now, and I've gotten the chance to speak with a lot of CAT aspirants, and I've been an aspirant myself. And if there's like one big takeaway, it is just that, you know, you don't need to get into all the top schools and uh, you don't need success, 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 success. You just need one yes, one success you need, and that will do the job. There's one little secret that no one really talks about, and that is there's a huge luck factor involved here, huge luck factor. If my interviewers had not asked me that first question I talked to you about, if it had gone south, then I would not be here today. So there is an inherent luck factor, their mood, the way it goes, the way you answer, whether you were prepared to answer that particular question or not. But the thing is, the more you try, the more likely it is that you might get lucky, right? 
so persistence and patience and not giving up are qualities that i really valued during this time and i didn't have them i, I used to just give up earlier but then i told myself that i am persistent i wasn't but i told myself that and eventually i became persistent so even if you don't have a quality that you think will help you succeed telling yourself that you you have it will help you act in a way that resonates with it and eventually become successful and just achieve your goals so that's it from me um i hope this was helpful and this will be my last uh, webinar as a host okay host and guest as, as a host here so i really hope that um, all the videos that i've created in the past one year add some value to your career that would make me very happy uh, i'll be more than i'll be more than happy to connect with you otherwise linkedin or you know even if we just randomly meet and anything um but yeah that's that's the story and uh, you all everybody who's seen my videos you've been an essential part of this journey my workplace has been a very essential part but the viewers that i got through my workplace have been very very important because in those times when i would feel low and i would doubt myself i would just open a youtube video and i read some comment and i think yeah <laughs> like it's good so that's about it thank you so much uh, for your time for joining in it's been a pleasure uh, being here and uh, all the best <laughs>